Hello everyone. Today we will have session on evolution of mobile technology from 1G to 6G. I am Ashok Kumar. Can you recognize the person in this picture? Yes, he is Cloud Stannon. Let us look at his contribution in wireless technologies. Stannon gave a theorem which is called Stannon theorem, very popular theorem and it is still relevant. What it tells is that capacity of a radio channel depends upon the spectrum. It is proportional to the spectrum we use, that is bandwidth, number of antenna we use in a transmission reception system and signal to noise ratio SNR which is also called signal quality. So, while we go into this session, we will further talk about the Stannan theorem or relevance of Stannan theorem. Do you recognize uh, this gentleman? Yes, he is Gordon Murray and for what he is famous for? He gave a theorem. It says that roughly Every two years, number of transistors on microchip will double. That means, in a giving, given form factor of a device, maybe our handset or maybe base stations, more and more electronics can be uh, built. That means, the compute, the memory, etc. can be uh, doubled in every two years. We can pack more electronics into it and his theorem is still uh, relevant or true. Now with this background, let us look at early mobile telephony which uh, was in 1940. So let us look at this. So at that point of time during 1940, Bell Lab invented uh, some sort of mobile communications. So, what they used to do is install a tower on a hilltop and connect with a landline uh, telephone exchange nearby. And this tower will cover about 20 miles, 30 32 kilometer of a radius. So, this area, the radial area, used to be called mobile service area at that point of time. So, the devices, the user side devices used to be installed in a vehicle, car, truck, etc. So, they were able to receive signal from the tower which, which was on a hilltop. But for transmitting, since the, there will be power li limitations, onto the device side, user device side which were installed in the car. So, smaller towers were installed along the road so that vehicles are able to transmit the data up to these smaller tower and then from here it used to go to the nearest landline uh, uh, public network. So, at that point of time, uh, they were using uh, lower side of the spectrum. So, initially about 35 megahertz uh, band, uh, 10 channels in 35 megahertz band were used. Later on, 11 more channels in 150 megahertz band was allocated. And later on, again, uh, from 450 megahertz, 12 channels were allocated. So, total of 33 channels over a period of certain time was allocated uh, by FCC in the USA for the mobile service uh, that was long long back during 40s. Now since number of channels were very limited uh, total of a 30 so in one of the towers they would be using uh, about three such channels, say 
in this MSA area, you have channel 1, 2 and 3. In another MSA area, you may have uh, channel 1, 10, 11, 12 and so on. So, every MSA mobile service area will use uh, up to 3 such channels. So, what does this mean is, at a time, 3 mobile users can connect to the network. So, the capacity, overall capacity would be very, very limited. At that point of time also, there was a concept of reuse of frequency. So, after 100 mile distance from a particular MSA area, the other MSA area can use the same spec, I mean same channels. So, here channel 10, 11 and 12 were used. So, same channels 10, 11 and 12 can be used beyond 100 mile distance to avoid interference. So, frequency reuse concept was there, but uh, the limitation was that you can use after 100 mile away. So, Bell Lab uh, have a video on this early mobile telephony that gives very, very pretty pictures of mobile communication at that point of time. So, later on you can watch that video by either reading this QR code or using this particular link. Now, let us look at evolution of mobile technology from 1G to 5G and later on we will also talk about 6G. This is a very good picture given by uh, Qualcomm in its uh, one of white paper about the evolution. So, let us have a look at it. So, 1G telecommunications came during 80s. So, it is not the exact year, but during that period it came. So, let us talk about that. So, at that point of time, it was for the first time that we have some sort of uh, mobile voice communication. So, it was analog voice, the complete technology was analog and the technologies which were in use at that point of time was AMPS in USA, advanced mobile phone system in USA and some other part of the world. There were certain other technology like uh, NMT, Nodiac Mobile Telecommunications or the TAX, Total Access Communication System. In different part of the world, different technologies were invented and used. So, evolution continued, right? So, from 1G to 2G, lot of innovation continued to happen and finally, during uh, 1990s, the 2G mobile communication came during the 90s. So, from analog voice, it became a digital voice and we call it efficient voice to reach billions because uh, 2G was a successful technology. So, there were a lot of technology which evolved during 2G. Those technologies were DMs, digital AMPS, GSM and uh, CDMA, IS95 version of CDMA. But what succeeded was the GSM technology. So, GSM technologies, uh, GSM technologies is still used uh, in many country for providing services and 2G is still uh, in many part of the world 2G systems are operating even now. So, it took about 10 years period to evolve from 1G to 2G. So, from 2G to 3G also evolution took almost 10 years, 10 years. So, from 1990 to 2000, the 3G came and 3G was like offering some sort of wireless internet. Although we had some kind of data during 2G that we, we, we call 2.5G, but the wireless internet came during the 3G era, year 2000. So, the focus shifted to mobile data from voice, our focus shifted to mobile data and the technologies which were successful was like CDMA 2000 EVDO, WCDMA and then it evolved to HSP and HSPA plus. But the successful technology was WCDMA and its evolution to HSPA or HSPA plus, we call it 3GPP family of technology. 
Now again it took almost 10 years to evolve from 3G to 4G and this time the focus was on mobile broadband and the technology which were uh, successful uh, for the 4G was LT and LT advanced. Although uh, WiMAX was one of the 4G technology, but it didn't succeed. But succeed was LT, and across the globe, LT is a technology which is still uh, in operation and still being uh, installed and expanded in many parts of the world. Now again, it took almost 10 years to evolve from 4G to 5G. So the 5G is like not only for voice or data, but for every sector of economy. So 5G supports use cases in all the sectors of economy and it is some sort of unified future proof platform. And we call it wireless edge because uh, edge computing, multi-edge computing comes along with the 5G. And the radio, we call it new radio, 5G, new radio. So to summarize, mobile technology is continuously evolving as we saw. Every 10 years, every 10 years, from one generation to the next generation, mobile technology evolves. And every next generation has brought over 10x to 100x increase in its capability. Now, let us look at every generation of technology one by one, starting from 1G. So, let us look at 1G radio characteristics. So, as you see in this picture that the frequency which we use uh, in 1G was from 800 and 900 megahertz band, particularly in AMPS. And then the excess technique we used was frequency division multiple access FDMA. That means whatever channel bandwidth you have from 800 megahertz band or 900 megahertz band, you divide into 30 kilohertz bands, smaller uh, bands. We also call it channel. So it is frequency division multiple access. So the channel bandwidth is 30 kilohertz. And the modulation at that point of time which was used was frequency modulation. Frequency modulation was very popular and that was used. And it was giving some sort of analog voice. So, let us look at further aspect of 1G. So, let us look at 1G network. So, the 1G network the spectrum was licensed spectrum in US. FCC allocated the spectrum for mobile technology in, in the two bands we talked about. So, these are the bands which were used at that point of time. And the concept of frequency reuse started during. 1G. That means if you are using a particular channel here, the same channel can be used in this cell also. So, the concept of hexagonal cell as you see in the picture and also the frequency reuse came during the 1G era itself which continued even in 2G. So, that means the neighboring cell operate on different frequency and frequency reuse is possible after few cells. And the 1G wireless communications were was actually mobile network, although there was certain issue related to handoff if you move from one area to other area, your call may get dropped, but it was a mobile communication. You can uh, communicate anywhere where you have a coverage. So, 
So the phone which were used were of slightly bigger size. Uh, this is a Motorola phone, mobile phone used during a 1G era. So what were the features of 1G network? So 1G was some sort of foundation for mobile communication. So the, all the foundations were laid during 1G era which continued uh, during 2G. The voice was analog voice, the technique used was analog and because of that the voice quality was poor, the phone size was slightly bigger and the battery inside it may not last for a longer period, so poor battery life. And then we have a limited capability of the overall network as we saw that uh, we are dividing into 30 kilohertz uh, channels and one channel can be used by one user only so limited capacity and reliability is also poor because of the analog techniques we are using. Now let us look at now let us look at evolution of technology from 1G to 2G. So what changes happened? So the most important change during evolution from 1G to 2G was evolution from analog technology to digital technology. So all the technologies which were being used for analog, uh, they became some sort of a digital be it NPS, NMC or TAC. For example, if you talk about GSM, so instead of using 30 kilohertz channel, so here the channel bandwidth got increased to 200 kilohertz and in this 200 kilohertz, it is divided into 8 time slots, right, this 200 kilohertz will have 8 time slots. So that means 8 simultaneous users can launch on to the one 200 kilohertz channel. So 8 users per radio channel. So the capacity got increased in this evolution. The frequency reuse concept continued from 1G to 2G. So one uh, concept is like suppose in one hexagonal cell, this green color, you can use more than one channel, right? So that you are able to support uh, many customers. One channel will support eight customers theoretically. So which of the frequencies can be used, which of the channels can be used in the same cell? So here what you see is that you have one channel here, you cannot use channel 2, channel 3 etc in the cell to avoid interference. So only after 6 channels, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so this channel 8, so channel 1 and channel 8 can be used. Similarly, uh, uh, channel number 15 can be used here and so on. So basically, you, you leave 6 channels and the next channel can be used. Similarly, now you will be using channel 2. So channel 2 is being used here in the another hexagonal cell. The other channel which can be used here would be the channel 9. So this was kind of a frequency use and of course after uh, a certain number of hexagonal cell you can reuse these frequencies again as it was happening in 1G. So that is one concept of 2G. The second concept which came during 2G was use of vocoders, voice vocoders. As we know that for a voice to be transmitted, we require 64 kilobit per second generally, which is used in our landline telephones. On a radio, since we have constant onto the radio, we cannot use 64 kbps. Lot of radio resources get wasted. 
so we use vocoder which can compress our voice from 64 kbps to 8 kbps because of the digital technology during the 2g era we were able to have compressed voice from 64 kbps to 8 kbps without losing the quality so that was a technique which was used to have more voice capacity onto the radio system and again while going back to a PSTN network if call is going back to PSTN network this 8 kbps will get up converted into 64 kbps so only on the radio side this 8 kbps compressed voice was used during the 2g You may recall this particular phone, this is Nokia 3310 phone, one of the popular phone during 1G era, 2G era rather. So let us look at uh, the 2G network. So on to the left side you have devices, there will be many users. On to the right side first you have VSS, base station subsystem which consists of base trans receivers, base station controllers, combinedly we call it VSS. On to the core side we have MSC, mobile switching center, GMSC, HB mobile switching center, HLR, home location register, AUC, authentication center, VLR, visited location register and so on, right. So, the features of a 2G network was that it was having a digital voice. From analog voice, we migrated to digital voice. The capacity of the system got increased because of the digital technique, the compression, vocoder, etc. we talked about. And also, we were able to do time division multiple access and have 8 number of users in a single 200 kilohertz channel. Most important feature which came with 2G is the mobility. Now you can take your mobile phone from one country to other country and mobile phone will work. So in my opinion this was one of the great feature which came with 2G, the mobility feature. And the second great feature was the SMS thought message survey which is still relevant today also we use sms for otp for financial transactions for any kind of login that has become a default uh, factor of authentication and then from 2g it, it got evolved to say 2.5g we call it 2.5g with gprs gprs is general packet radio service and then edge edge is nothing but enhanced data rate for global evolution this gprs and edge so some sort of data so with gprs we were able to go up to theoretically 40 kbps and with edge and all rather gprs evolved up to 171 kbps and with edge we were able to go up to 384 kbps so edge was uh, called 3. Point, uh, sorry 2.75 g from 2 g gprs become 2.5 g edge became 2.75 g so for sms or uh, network element which got connected we called it smst and for data part sgsn dgsn nodes were uh, added so sgsn is Serving gateway GPRS support node, serving gateway GPRS support node, and GGSN is uh, nothing but gateway GPRS support node. So, let us look at evolution of mobile technology from 2G towards 3G and within 3G further evolved. So now let us recall, let us recall 
the Sanan theorem. What Sanan says that capacity of a radio channel depends upon the channel bandwidth. So, what we saw in 1G, the channel bandwidth was 30 kilohertz. In 1G, the channel bandwidth was 30 kilohertz. And 2G, we saw that channel bandwidth got increased to 200 kilohertz. So, the capacity of the channel is increasing. In 3G, we started using channel bandwidth of 5 megahertz. So, that means the capacity of the radio channel will definitely increase. Let me erase the ink. Okay, so the 3G was actually leveraging the GSM core network itself. On top of that, this WCDMA technology was used. So, in terms of technology, in 1G, it was frequency division multiple access. We saw it. In 2G, it was uh, again FDMA along with CDMA, time division multiple access. And in 3G, we have W, CDMA, wide band, code division, multiple access. We also call it UMCS. So, 3G further evolved to HSPA, high speed packet access, by optimizing the data channel, like increasing the order of modulation and other aspects. So, in CDMA, WCDMA or HSPA, the priority was being given to the voice within 5 megahertz channel bandwidth. The first priority is for voice. After serving for the voice channels, voice request calls, whatever capacity is left is used for data. After voice users are served, remaining resources are used for data. So, that was the concept and the concept of the data in a pipe came during the 3G era. What I am trying to say is that if there is only one user in the network in the night, for example, so the entire capacity of the data can be given to one user. If there are more than one user, then this data gets divided among the users in some fashion. So, it became like a pipe and anybody opening uh, using the pipe can use the data. So, 3G continued to evolve from 3G to HSPA plus. So, what they were trying to use in 3G is like they started increasing order of modulation. For example, from they started using 64 QAM. So, this 64 this is QAM is quadrature amplitude modulation. So, if you increase the order of modulation, your capacity of bit per second per hertz will actually increase, right? So, with this, uh, they uh, went up to 63 plus Mbps of the speed and they also used carrier aggregation. So, in place of 1 5 megahertz channel, 3 carrier could be uh, aggregated, so it becomes 15 megahertz. So, as we saw in Sanon law that if you increase this channel bandwidth of the spectrum, your capacity of the radio will actually increase. So, in this case, it will increase by 3, 4. So, these were the techniques to actually enhance the data rate in 3G. So, there were many uh, releases of 3G by 3GPP, third generation partnership project started. Uh, so, if you look at release 5, so the speed which we had is 14.4 Mbps in downlink and 384 kbps in uplink. In release uh, 6, the uplink side enhancement happened up to 5.7 Mbps. In release 7, the voice capacity doubled and the data capacity also doubled. 
In release eight, they started carrier aggregation or multi-carrier. So the data speed increased to 42 Mbps in downlink direction and 11 in uplink. So release nine was again they introduced two cross two MIMO channel bandwidth of uh, 10 megahertz and multi-carrier. So with that, the data speed went up to 84 Mbps in downlink. 23 Mbps in uplink. So it went up to release 11 <clears throat> using MIMO using higher order of modulation and they were able to go up to the data rate up to 672 Mbps in downlink and 70 in uplink. But the point to note here is that during release 8 parallelly LT technology was also introduced by 3GPC. So most of the operator instead of evolving more in 3G, they migrated to 4G or LT. So let us look at various features of uh, 3G network. So you may recall this particular phone, uh, this is Blackberry phone, many of you must have used during that point. And this was the Apple phone which came during that period, so milestone. So Apple started producing phone, Blackberry, Blackberry came with their handset and certain features like a native email service. This is the network of 3G. So in terms of architecture, it is similar to 2G. The difference is that the radio part, we started calling as RAN, radio access network. The base station, we started calling node. And the BSC of 2G had become RNC, radio network controller. The so name change and certain functionality uh, change inside it. The core network uh, had two parts. One was circuit switch domain, which was exactly same uh, of the 2G, which we used. What we had is the packet switch domain consisting of SGSN, GGSN, etc. So the core network are, uh, was having two domains packet switch domain and circuit uh, switch domain. The rest of the component were similar or same uh, to 2Z. So the digital voice and SMS continued as was in 2Z. Mobility also continued. The what important aspect came during 3G was the mobile web browsing. You were able to now browse mobile, I mean browse uh, internet on your mobile itself. So the WCDMA, the speed envisioned by ITU was 384 kbps in a mobile environment and 2 mbps in a fixed environment. But 3GPP evolved it to like with introduction of HSPA high speed packet access, speed went up to 7.2 mbps as we saw earlier. And with HSPA plus we were able to go up to 71.6 Mbps theoretical peak data rate. So the services which started like these cameras were also started coming with, sorry, these phones were started coming with camera. So clicking the image and sharing became one of the important service during 3G. The video call like mobile were having 3G mobiles were having native video call facility although quality may not be good but video call was one of the feature and GPS based services also started like navigation and some apps started coming <coughs> based on the GPS because these phones were also embedded with GPS receiver. Now let us look at evolution towards 4G from 3G to 4G. So here 
again Shannon theorem coming into picture that from 5 megahertz in 3G, in 4G the channel bandwidth used was 20 megahertz. So this 20 megahertz was not absolute up to 20 megahertz that means channel bandwidth starting from 1.4 megahertz, 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz. So maximum channel bandwidth used in 4G is 20 megahertz and waveform chosen for 4G was orthogonal frequency division multiple access OFDMA. I hope you understand uh, OFDMA. So wider channels were used. The use of multiple antenna started happening. So advanced MIMO techniques were used. For example, 2 cross 2 MIMO means 2 transmitter and 2 receiver on both sides. And of course, the carrier aggregation. So, in release 10 of 4G, started with release 8. Release 8 was the first release of 4G. In release 10, this carrier aggregation came. So, up to 5 carrier can be aggregated. So, if you have 20 megahertz uh, carrier, 20 megahertz channel bandwidth and different carrier component, you can aggregate such 5 and then it can go up to 100 megahertz. So, your data speed would actually uh, get enhanced. So, these were evolution taking place towards 4G. So, in 4G, we are using FDD as well as TDD. FDD is frequency division duplexing. That means in uplink, we use a uh, separate spectrum than the downlink. So, uplink and downlink spectrums are different. In TDD, we use a uh, same spectrum for uplink and downlink. So, for some period of time, we use a spectrum for uplink and for next some period of time, we use it for downlink and so on. So, this is time division duplex. So, we also call it unpaired spectrum. So, we can have unsymmetrical or asymmetrical downlink and uplink. That means if the requirement of downlink data is more, more and more such time slots can be given for downlink and less for uplink. Whereas, in case of a FDD, which is also called paired spectrum, even if we are using less data in uplink, the entire spectrum allocated for uplink are idle kind of or unused kind of. So, just look at this particular 4G phone, so smartphone. So, from 3G itself, a concept of smartphone we started hearing, but actual smartphone started coming in 4G era. So, this is the network of 4G. So, the change which you see here is that here there is no concept of PTS and BST. It is a single entity which you call it E node B, right? So there are multiple E node B in a radio network which gets connected to the core. Core also was simplified uh, compared to the earlier core. It was made a flat kind of a network. So you have multiple many uh, network elements like uh, MME mobility management entity, you have SGW serving gateway, you have a PGW, PDN gateway, home subscriber uh, server HSS, PCRF policy and charging function and so on. So, you have a flat network. So, what are the features? Features are like uh, this is a data only technology in case voice has to be transported on the network you require something else called ims it multimedia uh, subsystem to support voice so voice here would be voice over lg because it's, it's a kind of voice over ip mobility is of course there as sms is of course there the important part is that it started supporting mobile broadband high speed data support. So, a smartphone 
mobile apps started coming during this period so your many of the applications got converted into mobile app all of us know social media advent of social media came during this period and lot of usage started happening so high video consumption because of the social media full started using then came our 5g so 5g is fifth generation of cellular network it is it has got new capability which creates like opportunity for not only humans we people but also to businesses society and so on so let's have a look at 5g so similar to 2g 3g 5g it has also got radio part which is called ng ran next generation radio access network sometime we also call it nr new radio or we call it z node b so it's all name for the ran and then we have a 5g core network and then finally it gets connected to data network like internet or any uh, server offering a service and here ue doesn't only mean mobile phone it may mean a drone it may mean a car it may mean a any object so so 5g enables a new kind of network that is designed to connect virtually everyone of us everything including machines object devices so this was for the first time that a mobile system was designed for objects machines up till now it was used to be designed only for humans so let us look at some key capabilities of 5g so what are those key capabilities so 5g supports a peak data rate up to 20 gigabit per second the spectral efficiency is 3 times better to 30 bit per second per hertz in downlink direction user experience data rate is also 10 times better than 4g and it is 100 megabit per second latency support is up to 1 millisecond it is also 10 times better than 4g the connection density is uh, 1 million that is uh, uh, 10 lakh support so i think figures will be so 10 lakh or 1 million device per square kilometer and it is 100 times more energy efficient than 4g so these are the capabilities of uh, 5g in terms of radio capability we should say so what are the different use cases or usage scenario of 5g so first usage scenario is enhanced mobile broadband or embb the second is urllc ultra reliable low latency communication and the third is massive machine type communication so we saw key capability we saw usage scenario so these three usage scenario combined with the capability which we talked about will enable use cases of 5g in public safety agriculture health transport logistics education entertainment and all other sectors of economy 5g will have some or other use case now let us look at various technologies which 5g is using so in 5g the channel bandwidth which we use can go up to 400 megahertz we saw that channel bandwidth in 4g goes up to 20 megahertz only in 5g we use frequencies even in millimeter wave so we use lower side of the frequency we use mid band and we also use higher frequency in 26 gigahertz 40 gigahertz and so on we also use a concept of massive wimo since we are using millimeter wave our wavelength will be smaller so antenna size will be small so in a small panel will have thousands of antenna embedded so that's why we are calling it massive mimo and this will enable some sort of beam forming and beam steering 
5G, there is a technique used called bandwidth part. Our devices can operate on smaller bandwidth uh, for certain applications like IoT or for energy saving. So, if a UE is designed for 400 megahertz, not necessarily all the time it has to use the entire uh, channel bandwidth. So, concept of bandwidth part. Then comes the concept of open RAN with 5G, where various component of the RAN, maybe a radio unit, distributed unit, or central unit, can talk to each other on an open interface. That means multiple company can build different component of the radio access network. We use network function virtualization. That means all the network functions are piece of software today, and they connect to each, each other on APIs, standard interface. And then we have a concept of network slicing. Since the network is virtualized, now I can have logically different network for different use cases. So we call it network slicing. The concept of edge computing, all because in 5G, the control plane and user plane are segregated. So this has enabled that most of the compute can be done at the edge itself. So, concept of edge computing. Then uh, there are certain evolution towards uh, uh, a concept called IAB, integrated access and backhaul, where the backhaul can be given by the previous base station to the next base station. There is a concept of side link, which was designed for V2X kind of services, but it has also got uh, many use cases. In release 17 onwards, the so satellite integration with 5G uh, is going on and release 18 onwards, there is a talk about using AI ML in various component of 5G and so on. It's like there are many technology which makes 5G as 5G including whatever we discuss. So let us look at the 6G vision or 6G virus vision. So India has released its uh, 6G vision very recently. So in that vision document, uh, we are talking about uh, sensing network, we are talking about imaging network, we are talking about location awareness, we are talking about presence technology like hologram. So these are different uh, kind of services or features we are talking about for 6G. Many companies have also released their vision. So on right side, what you see is a vision of uh, Samsung. So what they're talking about, a peak data rate of 1000 Gbps, that is one terabyte per second in 6G. They're talking about a user experience data rate of one Gbps. They're talking talking about doubling the energy efficiency, doubling the spectral efficiency and make better about 10 times on latency onto the radio side. Connection density again they want to go beyond 10 lakh per square kilometer, uh, 10 times uh, better and then reliability also they want to go beyond. So in 5G reliability is up to 10 to the power minus 6. So they may uh, go up to 10 to the power minus 7 or even beyond. So these are various vision being talked about various companies and the countries. The, the real vision would be coming from ITU maybe in next 3 to 4 months or 6 months time period. And on that the world, all the sta SDOs, standard developing organization will start working on. So with this, uh, 1G to 6G is complete, but we will uh, talk about certain regulatory and policy aspect, which most of the people in the field uh, working in this area would be, uh, uh, they have to think on these lines. For example, the frequency allocation to operators for every technology you require spectrum. So Spectrum can be bundled with the license 
or spectrum bundled with license uh, license when you give license to an operator or it may be a subscriber based allocation that means more the customer you have you can apply for more spectrum or it can be auction based allocation of the spectrum in india we are now following auction based we started with bundled with uh, license and we are giving more spectrum based on number of customers and now we have moved to auction based allocation so every aspect has its own pro and cons so as regulator or as a policy maker one has to look into this and decide then there is a tariff how much tariff is being charged by operators so whether you require a regulation or you want to go for market based pricing or you want to regulate the price then universal service obligations services should be available across the country even in the rural area which may not be commercially viable so whether a mandate is to be given to all the operators to cover even those area which is not commercially viable or some sort of government should give cost subsidy to build network into those area on security requirement the lawful interception provision is to be mandated cyber security has to be uh, taken care then use of trusted hardware and software so these are the aspect of security which has to be looked into by a regulator or policy maker or government and then promotion of indigenous technologies just like in india we are trying to promote indigenous technologies so policy on that and policy for healthy competition that operators should not uh, create a monopoly market and there should be a healthy competition so with this we are finished with our session so thank you